Hey, it's Gadget UK here again, back with another Amiga floppy drive repair video. We've got a few different drives, I think around four in total in this video. Um, now, I know we've covered drives so many times, you'll see in those videos and you're thinking, oh, I've not another floppy drive video. It's not all the same, there's some different things within this video. Um, you may want to just skirt over the, the bits you've seen before, like the initial cleanup work and stuff, lubrication, etc. But there's some differences that I felt merited a video uh, on these three drives, or four drives actually. The interesting thing with this is the power connector goes on here in that orientation instead of, you know, that way. You can see there, it's a TIAC FD235F. It's got a bit of tape here holding something on. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's the screws, look, the nuts that support the drive up. So, that's interesting. Uh, it's very, very dirty. A little bit of corrosion as well, actually, in places. But look inside there, absolutely filthy. So we'll start by just prising this apart, I think. I'm not even going to test it. I, I don't think it works. It's been given to me as a faulty drive at some point in the past. I'm not sure who, where this came from. I've got one drive from Plan C and uh, one, this one. I'm not sure where it came from. This is not the one from Plan C, I don't think. So you can see it's very dirty in there. And so we'll do the usual stuff of just cleaning up with uh, cotton buds initially. Let's just collect all the fluff and dirt. It's really dirty this drive. It's been a while since I've had one this bad. Just look at the bottom there, that just gives you a clue how much dirt is actually on this. So based on how dirty this is, I am uh, literally going to try it and separate this. I think I might be able to just lift this like that there and maybe this will come out, I don't know. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, that side's out. Let's try and undo those two screws there. I'm not really sure how it's held in. Yeah, if you lift these two, if you pull the two side parts apart there and lift the head up a little bit, you can see you can get it out from the back there and then you can perhaps slide it forward maybe. I'm not really sure how how to get that out now. We can certainly get in down there a bit better, so maybe that's all I need actually, that access. Just allows me a little bit better access to get onto there actually and give that a really good scrub. So as I say, we should get a little bit of grease around this uh, mechanism here. We just inject that. Yeah, you can see which way it slides. Get the excess off. Just show that. I want to get it all around there. I will get the excess off in a minute. going to use the wire brush there actually because there is just a little bit of, uh, I don't know, oxidisation. Right, so I'm going to clean the heads. I'll start on the actual head and I'll do outside around them in a minute. So, a fair bit of pressure there, that bottom one. You can see a little bit of dirt there, not a lot. And the top one, try and press down on it and be very careful. You can't press anywhere near as hard on these because they're on a kind of like uh, flexible piece of circuit board, you know, ribbon and they're very uh, wobbly so you could damage the top head very easily by putting too much pressure Just get some grease onto here when we move the head up and down in a minute as we exercise it that will distribute that so I can perhaps get some more grease on afterwards I want to go and test it first I think and if we try and get some grease down there on that rail yeah, it's gone all over the place look right. 
Of course there is some advantage in having just a little bit there because as the head slides up and down it gets uh, lubricated, you know, you get plastic there on the metal. This part here is pretty free but you can see it's had some grease there in the past so we'll just get rid of the old and we'll put some new on. And then just get rid of the excess. Right, I think we're going to give it a try. Let's see what it's doing. So I've got it all connected up there. Let's get a disc in. Is the disc going to go in? Uh, yep, I'm just going to hold it uh, like that. And let's see what happens. Oh, that's some activity. Yeah, can't find the boot sector. Yeah, I can't find the boot sector, so uh, well, for just for the moment, let's just put it on top of that. So, we'll just manually move the head, if we can, like this, this way a bit. What I want is for it to seek back to track zero. Now, the zero sensor's just down there on the PCB. So, if someone's removed the PCB, the alignment might be out here. Uh, anyway, let's just uh, power that on, see what that does. You see it go all the way back, then? Yeah, it's going do do do. I've seen that before, where it can't find the boot sector. Just for good measure, we will just carefully pull these ribbons out for the heads. There we go, one at a time. Just inspect them, look okay, and carefully push them back in. It's unlikely to be that. But it's worth ruling out, it's simple stuff. And of course the other thing that could be affecting things here is that cap, without a doubt. It doesn't look like this PCB's been off before, uh, because as I say, because your track zero sensor is underneath here, any movement of that PCB will of course adjust the uh, alignment. Disconnect and reconnect that just for good measure as well. Let's try it again. Let's have a look at the underside here as well. It's interesting, it's not doing anything there, is it? Let's just put the disc in and have a look there, see what's happened to the under underneath. Should be detecting the disc change here when we set the disc out, put the disc in. So that's interesting, that might indicate something wrong with the disc change switch. Let's try when this orientation is the correct way up. No, that is not even detecting disc change. Makes me wonder if the jumper's here right for an Amiga, actually. So the main thing I'm focusing on here is the disc change is not working. So it's like when you, you know, take the disc out, put another disc in, it doesn't start looking at the disc again. It doesn't do anything. It's like you've not pressed anything. Now, I messed around pressing this. Once I managed to get it to recognise the disc change. But only once. So anyway, we've just got some deoxid in there. We've had a bit of a... Press up and down with those, that hopefully might clean those out, the switches. Um, but also, I've just took off these jumpers here and reseated them, because I think one of them relates to disc change. I've compared these jumpers to how they should be set for the Amiga, and it seems okay. So, other than a head fault, capacitors, or alignment, I can't see what else could be wrong with it. So, let's, uh, let's connect it back up again. One thought I did have is I could connect two drives up, boot from a good working drive, um, load the diagnostic software, you know, a sys check, whatever it's called, and uh, go into the drive test, the alignment test there, and then test this drive that way, and try and adjust the alignment whilst it's uh, powered up. And I might get the scope onto it, that's something we've not done, I might do that. It could avoid a lot of rework and a lot of messing around, and manual adjustment. See what happens now. Right, so same thing. 
but it stopped spinning. I'm going to take the disc out, put the disc in. This is the thing, it's not spinning. It's not detecting a disc change at all. I can show you the underside here, watch. And if I press around the switch, nothing. It doesn't even attempt to look for it. So just testing these switches here. It's not working, is it? I don't think that switch is working unless it's on when it's. That's really weird. That switch is definitely not working, so I'm just going to use some braid here and uh, mop up the solder. I did reflow it just in case, but it's not made any difference. So let's try and get all of the solder off there. I've successfully managed to join it to the solder look. We just need to somehow try and free this up now. I'm not really sure the easiest way because it's kind of slid onto the PCB and it's going to get hindered by the frame here. I think the best thing to do now actually is to take this board out. So let's just get these screws out here. It hasn't moved so far, but uh, yeah, anyway, let's, let's just draw around it. Because as soon as we unscrew that, that is going to move out of position. You can also just draw on the board there, like that, can you see that? Uh, and here as well perhaps. Yeah, you can see what I mean. Anyway, and if we just uh, pull this uh, hood back a little bit here I think, there we go. That should mean that flat flex will come out. And then hopefully this PCB may come out. Yeah, there we go. It's pretty heavy. So we can get access around here now. There's an interesting thing here with two little metal contacts. I've got no idea what that is. It's really weird. Anyway, the main reason to get that out was so we can get this off. Uh, and I guess we're going to have to heat all three of these at the same time, perhaps. I mean, you could use hot air, but it's plastic. It's going to melt. So if we try and I don't know, heat these and pull that way. moving a bit. Nearly there. There we go, it's off. We can use some braid on there as well. But now we've got that out, we can test it out of circuit and see if we can get it working. You can sometimes prise the clear plastic base off here as we did earlier on the Archimedes one in order to get inside it and service it. But I might just soak that in some contact cleaner or something for a bit and then just test it. So I think the instincts were right taking this off. If I just try and get the contacts on there like that and then press it, there's like nothing, nothing at all on any of the contacts. Nothing when they're closed, nothing when they're pressed. Nada. That is really weird. But you see the legs are black here, can you see that? So maybe some corrosion has got inside it. So as you can see, you've got the base off, you can see I've warped the plastic a little bit here because I had to prise it obviously with a, a screwdriver. So we've got the base off, it can go back in, but can you see these contacts here? These are the things that go up and down. Uh, it's misaligned here, this normally would be... I can't really see what I'm doing here, hang on. That would normally be like that there and it goes up and down. Uh, so uh, the contacts, let me just take this out. I've got to be really careful not to lose these now, but they should come off the top if I'm careful. There we go, the plunger's come out with it, look. There's that gun there. Oh, these are so fiddly to work on. There we go. Yeah, I've got the copper contact there, let's pull it down. They're pretty gold plated actually. And we pull the plunger out. And we'll do the same with that one. But the contacts are going to be in here. 
and I think they're all oxidized and green you can sort of see that down here so anyway let's get these out yeah you can see in there they're all black so I've got to somehow clean that up I might start with a bit of vinegar and a toothbrush actually so the switch may never work again but we have nothing to lose here really it's uh, you know beyond a drive that someone else couldn't get working I do think we've got two issues with this I think we're going to have an alignment issue as well or maybe the heads have gone on it or something I don't know so I guess if you're looking for symptoms on yours the black legs on the outside there are just before it solders that is a clue that something has gone on internally with it perhaps although I'm sure I've seen them like that before with like black extended legs and they're alright so I don't know and it's just this one. What I really need to do now is get something uh, small enough that I can get in there and touch the surface. I wonder if someone's put oil or something on this. Can you see it's starting to clean up now? All I've been doing here is just getting my pointy tool into here. I'm sorry, it's not going to stay focused. This is it is on the macro, um, and just have a, a slide around very carefully. I'm trying not to obviously remove the surface, but just get the contaminant off the surface. Uh, and as you can see, we're kind of getting shiny, 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 shiny. That's all we need. So anyway, I'll keep keep going at that there, and then I'll rinse it out with some IPA, get some deoxid in there, and uh, carefully reassemble it. So we get a little bit of uh, deoxid in there, and have a little uh, brush with that as well, actually. Yeah, it's starting to look really clean in there now. I've cleaned the wider extended legs as well, actually. You can see I've got the corrosion off here. One thing that might be worth doing on this, and I think I may do it, once you've fitted the switch on and soldered it in place, get some hot melt glue right up over these legs here because that's where it seeps in. That's where the corrosion has seeped in. It seeps in through the leg end. Of course, it could be that some that's seeped out from the inside. As I say, if someone's put the wrong kind of uh, contact cleaner there or something, or some oil, maybe that was the issue. Maybe they sprayed WD-40 in it and uh, it's affected the uh, plastic the plastic is sort of just, I don't know, leaked off onto the contacts or something like that anyway you can see it's pretty good that now it was black before, you couldn't see any contacts at all there we go, that's the contacts back in so the super tricky part now is to get the spring on the top of there for each of them, oh see I've nearly lost it, I've got to go find it now, where's it gone? Uh, and then get the plastic base on, so that is really really hard to get back together well somehow I managed to get that back together as you can see, I don't know how it was a miracle, but just watch this now, we seem to have created a capacitor or something it's a bit strange continuity I'm not moving on the contacts here you can hear it pulsing, hang on let's do that again what is going on? press it down, obviously open circuit I just don't understand where it's beeping. And here, look. And here, look. Could be because my battery's low, I've just noticed the battery indicator's on there. See that? Press it down. Um, not making a good contact there. There we go. Anyway, that's good. That's alright. I think that d d d d d is the battery. <laughs> it's got to be either that or this is like charging up and discharging very quickly. I don't know. Very strange. Let's get it back. Let's get it back on the drive. So we'll certainly clean up around there before we reintroduce that switch because there's some fuzziness and stuff, isn't there? That'll do, I think. Let's just uh, wipe that area. Let's have a go with a fiberglass pen there as well, just because it just looks a bit weird, doesn't it? There we go. If you go too far, you remove too much of the zinc coating off there, and then it's uh, you know it's a uh, a potential source for rust in future so we need to flip it over this way and this connector here and the switch is actually it kind of slides on it's got a little groove there look and it just slides into place like that that's it so we can just uh, get some fresh solder onto those contacts there I don't think this drive will ever work again but you know what it's just been interesting to well if anything clean that switch out I'm getting quite a dab hand at cleaning these switches now. And when I say cleaning them, I'm talking about you know taking to pieces like we have done. They're incredibly small. That's it. 
One thing I don't like about this is that side there is not coming out very far, is it? They don't come out very far in general, to be honest. Uh, a bit of flicking like that is perhaps what's required when you get that kind of issue. Because once it's been flicked in and out a few times like that, there we go. Yeah, they don't stay stuck in. I'm just going to just test it again. Ah, yeah. Multimeter is beeping all the time now, look, on the continuity. So that gives me confidence that the switch is working. It's just my bloody meter battery. Yeah. Yeah, it's working fine. So I put it back together in reverse, the hard bit was getting that ribbon there and you could kind of got to get the board in at an angle, get the ribbon in. Once the ribbon's in, clip the hood in and then put the board down. And then obviously we've had to get this uh, lined up with these red marks and things, so I think that's pretty accurate. Anyway, let's go try it again. So it's not going to boot here, but what it should do, it should recognise when the disc is put in. And then when we take it out and put it in again, it should try it a second time. Yep. So that's good news. It's obviously not working. Let's take it out, put it back in again, and it's having a second try. That's brilliant. And of course, while that's uh, working that way, it just assists with adjustments there. You know, you could now carefully just loosen this PCB, adjust it a little bit. You may have to manually move the head up here while it's on. But then when you stick your disc in, it will seek back to track zero because it recognises the disc is in. If you've not got that switch working, as we have now, you've got to keep powering the thing off and on and starting from the beginning kind of thing. It's a bit painful to do that way. So I kid you not, a couple of hours later, I spend incredible time faffing with these. You can see I've taken the stepper off. There was an issue. I adjusted the, uh, you know, the two screws at the side and the screwdriver just caught the end of the ribbon and ripped it. Uh, can you see? I'll perhaps show you on macro in a minute. So I've fixed the outer trace there with some coil wire, yeah, I've tested connectivity, it's good. Scratched a little bit of the trace here and put a little wire there to fix those two first connections. Anyway, that's all that. Um, I put it back together and it was jammed a little bit. Now I realise there's a ball bearing here which I think goes, uh, sorry it doesn't go there. There's a ball bearing there which I think goes under here, actually at the point where it meets with the rail. Is that the bottom head? Yeah, it is. And then obviously got the top head here, so yeah, it's all come to pieces. I've taken everything out, everything's exploded, the ball bearing flew off somewhere. It took me ages to find that. Um, cleaned out in here with uh, the wire brush again. There were some bits of metal on here, some bits of corrosion. I don't know if it's just like making the head restricted or something when it was moving around. Like aluminium these, I think. But, uh, yeah, anyway, that's that. They get that hair out of there. So I just need to now reassemble it. Where that bar goes here, there's a bearing there. I can see little ball bearings in there. So I hope, I mean, looking at it, I can see it doesn't look like there's one missing. I just don't get where that ball bearing there came from. But the reason I just took the heads off is because I figured it's perhaps from under here. Is that another ball bearing just fell off? Is that the same one? I think that's the same one actually. I thought I had two there for a minute. Uh, yeah, I think it goes under here somewhere. I'm just not sure where. It took me ages to work that out, but I think that ball goes into those ball bearings there. I've used some grease to attach the ball bearing to a metal tool, and it just happens to fit in between the six or seven, or, uh, so I think seven, uh, small ball bearings in the bearing. So uh, the key now, I think, is going to be to get this back on. So I've got to put it through here the flex ribbon down there and then and then try and mate it with that there because it's kind of got a hollow end there we go that's it yeah so you've got one ball bearing inside a bearing inside the cavity of the end of this so now I've got that I can attach the mounts here start to get it all back together I think we came to the same conclusion last time I looked at a TIAC drive that the TIAC ones are the worst ones. <sighs> Chin on are way more serviceable compared to these pieces of crap. Yeah, this sort of slides in here. Like that, there we go. 
and then we've got this little thing here which goes that way up and then sort of slides in between the cavity here and this is where you got to watch watch you don't snag the wire it's got to go under it uh, I really shouldn't be doing this here because obviously the PCB is on the carpet uh, trying to work out which way this goes now so it goes that way around doesn't it so we need to sort of get it onto there like that and <laughs> fine we can't get it in oh, this is the problem with this yeah straight that way like that slide it on here yep and try and get it into position the bar needs to come down a bit there there we go yep and then this thing then has to go under hang on which way around does it go it goes this way it has to go under there like that can't see what on earth I'm doing that's it, it wants to go on top of there that's it uh, try and find the screw where's the screw gone Do you know all the while I'm working on this I see the words go tech in giant 90 pitch font because if you've got a go tech you don't have to do all this faffing around here with the drive. Now I think this one went on the outer edge. Did it? I honestly can't remember now. We'll soon find out. Yeah, anyway, that's that one on. So then we can get this one on. Yeah, it makes sense for this one to be on the inside, I think. This one has to be fed through its little thing on the underside here, does it? Where does that go? I wish I'd been paying attention when I took it to bits. Yeah, that one goes on the inside. Like that. That head goes there. Uh, <laughs> what happens with this? I can't remember. Yeah, it goes this way up here. So we need to get the spring. Hang on, what's going on here? This is where it's probably easy to shut the drawer. There we go. Shut the tray. You've just got one less thing to contend with. Hang on. And then this. Tell you what, that spring thing, let's stick the spring thing on last because I did take that off completely before and I was able to get it back on. It's better if that spring thing goes on last. Let's just check that's going through its little feed here. That's it. And then uh, Yeah, that goes that way. Like that, I think. Yeah, there we go. It's got like a little centering thing in the middle of it. So if I now try and hold that together, it's going to fall off in it. Let's get the screw. Let's try and put that back together again. Obviously, I'm going to have to try and line the heads. I've talked about that before. The best way to do it is to close the drive so that both heads are set on top of each other, and undo these so they're loose, and move the top head around until eventually it's totally centered on the bottom head. That's a good rule of thumb because that tends to be how, for the most part, the line. You may get some drives where the top head's to the side a little bit or it's forwards or backwards a little bit in relation to the bottom head. But anyway, we can do that a little tweak and adjustment later. I did tinker with it before in that sense, so I know there's a bit of uh, uh, flexibility. So I know uh, roughly where to set it. So with these springs like this, you're better off getting it from the side like that with a spring. Get one bit on and the other bit on like that, if you can. Push it onto that thing there. Easier said than done, there we go. And then pull this little bit here up, like that, over there, to the middle. That's it, it's on. And then we can just carefully try and get under that and put it onto, there we go, that's it all sorted. So I had a quick look down there, you can see the heads are almost aligned so it's approximately right that we can just tinker with it and see see, <laughs> see whether it works. So the reason I knew that, that there was an issue here with that ball bearing that seemed to have flown out, when I did this here, yeah you can move it now, you couldn't move it before, it was impossible to move. Um, and that's the thing, you know this bar would have been jamming a little bit on here, now it's not, 
So now we've done that, let's just get a little bit of fresh grease on. I'm going to go and have another tinker with it. I've got no doubt I'm going to get exactly the same error I was getting before. It was getting to a certain point in the disc. Um, and then giving a bad sector error. And uh, interestingly, it's the same no matter what. It doesn't matter what you do to it. Well, you know what? The amazing thing there is I've done no more alignment, no adjustment, no nothing. Just put it back together and I'm getting exactly the same error. Which is a good sign, because you'll know yourself, if you've taken one of these drives to pieces and messed with the heads like that, 99 times over 100, it won't even read a disc after you reassemble it, but the first time, put it back together, it's doing exactly what it did. So this is June, it gets so far here, and then it always comes up with this error. Read error on uh, disc block 869. Um, now you can mess around with the alignment of the top head, that never changes. So I don't think it's like a top head alignment issue. Now if I change to uh, sys check, the interesting thing with this one, this never gets off the boot sector, but it doesn't give up. It kind of retries and retries and retries right on the boot sector. Yes, yeah, so we're going duh, 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 and then duh, 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 and it just keeps doing that forever. It never gives up. That is really weird because usually if you've got a problem on the boot sector, you'll get the three you know, retries there and then that's it, it gives up. But that isn't what happens on this disc. Uh, but this disc obviously gets a lot further. It gets well past the boot sector. So it's very odd the way this behaves. You may think alignment, but like I say, I've messed around with alignment no end on this. You saw that I've just you know refitted the heads here, but I've had the heads forwards, backwards, all different angles around and stuff. Obviously, I've adjusted the track zero, you know, the position of the PCB underneath in relation to the track zero sensor. All that happens is you start at the back, you don't get any boots at all, and you gradually move forward, move forward, move. Eventually, you get to this point here where this does, you know, this boots. But then, if you move it a tiny bit further forward, you don't get anything again. You've lost it. Right, let's get that cap off. I just ESR tested it, and it's showing 100 microfarad, 108 microfarad, uh, and uh, many ohms. I'm just heating up this iron here, just to speed up the heating of it. Um, and I can smell electrolyte like just from heating that one pin on one side as well. So, uh, yeah, it's 10 microfarad, 16 volt. Let's get it off. This may be related to the rotation timing, you know, and if it is, that would explain why. Certainly, all, a lot of the discs I've tried, it's when you get further into the disc, you get a problem. The first quarter to half of a disc seems all right. I can smell it again. There we go. Let's just get that off. The band was still left, by the way, so anyway, let's just, uh, we can try and mop up that as well. I almost touched that plastic resonator or whatever it is there as well. This is what I hate about this braid, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's wide and it splits, it's not very well uh, woven. Let's just try with the Antex and we'll get a bit of a better thermal connection there on that tip. Yeah, there we go, that's not bad. Oh, it's sticking again. Right, we're going to get any capacitor. Yeah, I think that should be okay. So let's just uh, solder this side. Uh, yeah, this side I think is not in position now. Looking at that. Let's just try and uh, rotate it a little bit. Yeah, that should do. Yeah, the print on the can is not straight, which it doesn't help. If you're doing it without magnification as I am here, it can... Uh... Yeah, the point I was trying to make there is the, if the print's not straight on the can and using the print as a reference as to whether you think it's straight or not, you'll not get it straight. Anyway, there we go, that's on. Uh, that's the right way around. I'll clean up with cotton buds and stuff in a sec. Right now I want to go try it. Yeah, same exact issue. So despite the fact that cap had uh, leaked there, uh, started to leak, it's, uh, it's not the fault. Bear in mind there are two other caps we could swap out. Might do that next. I'm getting a little bit desperate really. Look, same error again on that disc. It's always the same. 
I'll try June again, but I'm guessing we're going to get exactly the same thing where it gets so far into the disc and then we get the bad block error. It's weird that it can get that far, isn't it? That's what I don't quite get. It's like the middle of the disc it has an issue with. Look, same one, 869. Makes you think it's the disc, but it's not. I'll try that disc in any other drive, it works fine. So I've got one of my test A2000 boards set up with the TF536 here. And I'm using a good known working floppy drive that is well calibrated and works with every single disc I throw at it. And I'm just formatting a disc here so that we've got a you know a, a benchmark, if you like, a something you know, known formatted disc that's been formatted on a well calibrated drive. And then we'll swap over to the other drive, we'll run a sys test and we'll go into the track alignment test. And what that does, it continuously rereads the same track and you can increment the track and it rereads it over and over and over so you can actually see whether you're getting good alignment on specific tracks. And we'll step up the disc, just see, see what we see really. See, is it you know a, a problem further into the disc, which I think it is, it seems to be that way. So I know what you're thinking, you're thinking if I need to run test kit in order to do the head alignment, how can I do that? Because I can't boot my floppy drive that way. And it's my DF0, you know, it's the first drive there that I need to boot from. Well, if you get an external drive like this, and you connect this up to your Amiga. Now, I've not got DF0 connected at the moment, but trust me, this works because uh, I've uh, done it. And if we switch it on, we've got to test kit in the drive. What it will do is if you've got your blank disc in here, you've got this connected here to the, you know, the normal place on your motherboard, it will try and boot from DF0, and when it fails, certainly with Kickstart 3.1, it will then look at that drive and boot from that drive. But that process only works if you've not got a hard disk. The hard disk will take boot priority. So what I'll have to do is do boot options and choose uh, DF2. It's strange, that's DF2. It must be the switch on the back of the drive. So you can boot from either DF2 or DF1. Uh, but if we let that go through now, that should boot from the floppy drive, should boot test kit. There we go. So if we had DF0 connected, uh, what I could do there is go into the floppy drive tests and we can uh, change the drive we selected here. I forget how you do it now. Yeah, see the. Yeah, just go straight into head calibration test. You'll see it says there DF0, no track zero or drive not present. And that is correct, there is no drive. But if the drive was there, as you'll see in a minute when I connect it up, that's how I'm testing. I'm booting from DF2 here and then we're testing DF0. And we're using that disk we formatted that's uh, on a, from a good known working drive where we know the, the, the tracks, the way they've been written, are aligned perfectly. You can get two versions, one that's bootable and one that you can run from your hard disk like this. And if you're going to floppy drive and we do head calibration test, yeah, can you see there? So it's in zero out of 11, on, and it shows you the side. Side zero. 0 out of 11 in terms of its accuracy. Side 1, 0 out of 11. So I can now mess around with the alignment and uh, try and get 11 out of 11. So I'll report back when I've made some progress. So this is Gadget from the future actually. Dial the bottom head first. How do you do that? Well the adjustments, I showed this on a previous video, just these screws here and you see that little notch? Yeah, That little notch you can just move it a quarter of a millimetre, tighten them up and uh, you probably need to move the head away from track zero, yeah, and then retest it. Because if you don't move it away from track zero, you see, like when you first switch the drive on, when you first switch the machine on, it'll move to track zero. If you then adjust this, you've adjusted the position of track zero, but it's still at zero, so it won't reseek. So that's why you've got to move the head uh, back up here. The other thing you can do for track zero on this model of drive, as I've shown previously, is just these screws here. There's like an uh, elongated hole. It's not round. It's uh, you know sort of that sort of shape, oval. Uh, and the board here will go up a little bit or down a little bit. So that's the equivalent of doing this. And in fact, that's more of a fine adjust. This is like a large adjustment. So you know, if you've taken the PCB off, do what I did with the sensor. Draw uh, around here with uh, a pen. Yeah, a red marker or something, and then you can you know fit the PCB and get it in exactly the right position. But if you're not finding track zero even from adjustment here, adjust this a little bit and retest. But again, every time you'll have to move the head away from track zero, power the system again to get it to seek back to zero, the new zero that you've set either with this or with this.
So I had a change in setup here. I'm now using the standard 68000 and I've got an external drive I'll show you at the back. And because I've got Kickstart 3.1, if I put a blank uh, formatted, you know, properly formatted disk in the drive we're testing here and sys test in the DF1, you know, the second drive, it tries to boot from DF0, fails, and then boots from DF1. That's a nice feature of Kickstart 3.1. I don't think normally you know, three, at 1.3 would boot that way from DF1, but anyway, I could be wrong. Um, you can see it's made some progress. Now initially here I was getting a 0, a zero, a zero out of 11 on both the top and bottom. So I adjusted the screw under the PCB, you know, and messed around with that a bit to get the track to zero alignment. Didn't get anywhere with it. So I unscrewed, put it in the middle, so the PCB is banged in the middle, still wasn't getting anywhere, 0 out of 11. And then I've adjusted these two screws here to loosen it, and I've been able to twist the motor and retest, retest, retest as I'm twisting it a little bit. And as you can see, we've now got 11 out of 11 on the lower head. I've just tightened that um, screw there because I know that the alignment is correct in relation to the stepper motor. And if I do reseat current cylinder, you can see that 11 out of 11. Yeah, we're on track 79 at the moment. If I change the cylinder to zero, look, 11 out of 11. But the bottom head is not working at all, it would seem, at this stage. Uh, sorry, not the bottom, the top. Yeah, it gets a bit confusing. Sorry, it says upper there. The upper one is coming up. Oh, it's got one out of 11. Uh, zero. Yeah, the upper one is zero out of 11. So we know we need to deal with the upper head. Yeah? If I change the cylinder throughout the disc we could get 11 out of 11 on the bottom head so that is positive news so I mean it could be a faulty head I don't know so I'm now going to undo the screws on there you can see I can move the head a little bit and I'm going to experiment reading the same sector over and over and when I say sector I mean cylinder if I just reseek the current cylinder we can now mess around with the position of that top head and just see what we get and it seems nothing, doesn't it? It seems like nothing. Hang on, let's knock the bottom one out, look, man. That's interesting. How does the top one knock the bottom one out? Look, that's now got four on the lower. Hmm, maybe the lower and the upper are actually round the wrong way. Let's just put the head back. Hang on, look, we've got something there. Six out of eleven now. Ah, right, now it's real time, so I can just adjust that head slightly and wait until we get eleven out of eleven. It's really weird how just in one adjusts the other. Of course, I'm putting pressure on the whole mechanism while I'm doing that, so it's bound to knock the other head out. So anyway, I'll report back in a few minutes. Right, I know what the problem is. I've just took the head off because I was getting 0 out of 11. You did see just at one point there we had like 4 or 5 out of 11 and then it just disappeared. I could never get it back no matter where I positioned the head. This is the first thing you'll notice, and I noticed this before, this metal here can just lift it up. Sometimes what's ha what happens is this head gets caught, you stick a disc in it, pushes this head here, it lifts this, so this metal has lifted up. But more importantly, can you see these little orangey bits here? It's like a little bit of glue. It's probably like silicon or something. I'm going to try and heat it um, because because if I just uh, get your focus on that, can you see it's broken off? Look, which means when you get you know and this this by the way is required to get the bottom head reading because unless you've got sufficient pressure from above, the bottom head will not read. You know this presses the disc slightly down, so the two have a relationship, and that's why when I was adjusting this, you'll notice that the other head was uh, you know jumping all over the place just because I was lifting this up while I was adjusting it and it didn't have that pressure but nevertheless with the friction of the disc and this pressing down obviously it's moving to the side ever so slightly because that glue is not holding it firmly in place so I need to try and uh, bend this back flat and then I need to use some hot air I think I could always try replacing that with I don't know some something I'm not sure what if I can't uh, get it to join again, but you can see, you can see it's split. You can see there, but you can see it's lifted up. Look, the, the orange glue. So yeah, let's let's try and do that. See if we can salvage it. Of course, it could be that it's been lifted up quite a bit from an impact, and the wires could have detached. But I don't think so. I think it is that glue. I think the glue is the problem. 
So I tried heating it to uh, reflow the glue, whatever it is, but I don't think it is. I think it's like a silicon or something. So heat didn't do anything. So I tried a tiny bit of hot melt glue on each side, heated that up to 160 degrees. I protected the top of the head. What I did is I pressed it down flat like that and then just heated the side there where the glue was. That all glued together, but then as soon as I looked at it, I could literally just touch the head and the glue was separating from the silvery metallic bit. The glue's not bonding to it. So I can't think how else to attach that other than with some silicon. I don't have any silicon. So what I'm gonna do is use this 3M thermal adhesive. It's really, really sticky stuff. You stick it on something like that, it's very hard to get rid of. It will, and it's elasticy, so it will support some movement. So I, I guess if I cut a really small sliver of this and flatten this down, stick it right up to the very edge there, do the same over there, that might just get this up and running. It's not designed, you know, this isn't gonna be a, uh, permanent way to fix it I mean, it might might be a long-term fix i honestly don't know there we go i'm not going to win any awards for <laughs> tidiness there but uh, that should do let's go and give it a try we need to try and feed the ribbon through the little gap that's the first thing to do there's a little gap there in the plastic where the other ribbon goes yeah there we go it's in So tighten it and then loosen it. And that should mean we can move the head look. And if we just carefully connect its ribbon, I mean it might not work now because we've been heating it or near it. You never know, the heat we applied or the heat I applied may have melted the coils or something like that. So we don't know. Let's just give it a try. I'm pretty sure that's it because look, I just moved it a tiny bit and we straight straight away getting some stuff coming back here so I'll just experiment around a little bit move it forwards and backwards and side to side hang on a sec yeah if you move it too far like that obviously it goes right out Let's just try and put it back where it was of course it could be a bad head because look we're on 011 again just from moving it so so that took an incredible amount of messing around with I think the mechanism's a bit worn you can see 10 out of 11 is not bad. Oh, and 11 out of 11 there, look. Occasional issues. But that might just be enough to get it going. So I'm coming to the conclusion that the wires that lead into this might be the issue. You can see, you know, it's still a bit warped, this metal and stuff. The tape is holding it in place. Um, but I just want to show you if I can get a focus on this. If I, can get, if I can try and get a focus, can you see on the head there, there's some light scratches. I'll perhaps zoom in even on the macro. Yeah, there's some light scratches there on the surface. So I kid you not, so I kid you not, I've spent a full day on this. Um, can you hear the noise? There's different noises depending on which track you're on. Just listen, hang on. So we're on cylinder zero. In fact, there's a constant whining all the time, but it's a bit louder there. But can you see we've got 11, 11, 11, 11, perfect in the middle of the disc. A little bit flaky on the outside there, look. But depending on how you hold this drive, sometimes turn upside down, it gets worse. You can see one head's okay there, the top head, 11, 11, bottom head not. This is the weird thing with this, it's like... I'm starting to think about the spindle mower. I might just get some lubrication into it. And it's a similar thing on the first side to look, if I, re if I reseek. But you can hear the whining. But I tell you what, he's taking an incredible amount of messing around with that, messing around with positions of this, taking the head off and on, off and on. I removed those little bits of tape that were down the side and actually that's, that's how things stand now. I seem to have got more stability. And if anything, the problem it's reporting now is the bottom head the top head it's quite happy with. The bottom head, it's, you know, that's the one that's sort of fluctuating and going up and down. And you can see what I mean there on sector zero, it's the bottom head that's the issue. And if I change the uh, cylinder, it's because the middle of the disc. Everything's fine in the middle of the disc. How, how explain that? How can we be totally okay with both heads in the middle of the disc, but have a problem at either side of that? 
Oh, the reseek. It's reliable, it's consistent, look, rock solid in the centre of the disc. This is why I'm thinking about that motor. Oh, hang on, saw a little glitch there on the top head. Anyway, let's go to sector uh, 80. Strangely enough, that humming's not noticeable here, but look, those are both all over the place now. But often than not, look, you get, you do get 11 out of 11 on one of them. Uh, well, I think I've answered the problem. And that's the problem why the bottom head was intermittent. It was literally hanging off. It has literally just fallen off. There's a hair there, look. Anyway, so it was a successful fail. <laughs> um, you know, we've dealt with the switch there, messed around with the alignment until the cows come home, got the top head working, and then uh, had this problem with the bottom head. And, uh, yeah, you can see it's literally just fell off. Look, there's a bit of it hanging there, look. That's the coil. Look, the wire's still attached. Uh, snapped it off. So, uh, mm, very disappointing because I did spend crazy hours on that. But nevertheless, if you don't, if I don't learn something and share it, you don't learn something. Um, I think what's happened with this is the disc has got jammed or something in there because certainly it looked like the top head had been mangled a little bit. Um, anyway, that's the end of that drive, isn't it? Just needs new heads. So I've got another same make and model here. My aim was to swap the heads around, but this one has got a faulty bottom head as well, I think. But it could be the alignment. I'm gonna experiment moving the motor in a minute. Let's just see if we can get any activity on the other head. But you can see there as default, it's showing zero of 11 on the bottom head, the lower head. And if I seek to a different cylinder, middle of the disc, same thing, end of the disc, and then both seem to disappear here, look. Yeah, both zero, 11. So that makes me think it is an alignment thing. Maybe we can get that top head working because I did see the exact same thing on the other drive. And only when you start to adjust the track alignment do both heads start to come into you know a proper alignment. Anyway, I'll report back in a minute when I've made a little bit of progress. And there we go, just literally unscrewing the screws, you can see it sprung back to life. So it, it definitely is, without a shadow of a doubt, an alignment problem. Um, so if I just twist that motor one way or the other, we can dial it in a little bit. I'm trying to get 11 11 if I can. Yeah, it still doesn't boot. So if we look at the end of the disc here, cylinder 80, you know, 0 to 79, 0 to 79, 0 out of 11 there, look. Go back to 0, mostly 11s. So, I'm not sure, I saw the same thing on the other drive, and then a bit flaky in the middle. It's uh, strange to say the least, doesn't it? Why at the end of the disc there would you get nothing? I think I'm going to swap those heads over onto the other drive, because at least on the other one we've changed all the caps and stuff on it. Uh, well, the ones that are relevant. Um, yeah, I'm going to do that, I'm going to swap those heads over. It must be mechanical wear or warpage of the mechanism, it's got to be. Because just watch this, so if I go back to cylinder zero, you can now see I've dialed it in, perfectly there, yeah? Middle of the disc. Not too shabby, it's not perfect, but you know, it's, it's, it's almost there. And then the end of the disc, zero. Zero out of eleven. How, you know, the ribbon is the obvious thing. You start thinking, is it the flex ribbon? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. There's some sort of uh, issue where, I don't know, as it goes up the disc, let's say the disc is not uh, straight like that. Let's say it's just like that, just by, you know, a quarter of a degree. By the time you go up the disc, you start to have a problem where you're at, you know, the top, the top position of the disc. But then I would expect it to be affecting both heads and it isn't doing that's the strange thing. So why would it only be the top head when it gets near the outer edge of the disc? That's the thing I'm having a hard time understanding here. Unless it needs lifting up slightly, if I just pull the metal, does that make any difference? No, so it's not, not the chassis. I'm gonna try and press the head a little bit here. It's not perfectly positioned. Oh, I don't know. It's driving me nuts, this one. 
Yeah, see I've moved the top head now, so now it's out. That top head is really fussy. So just looking at this drive from Tom Meads, can you see how fast that's spinning? That is spinning too fast. Sounds a bit noisy as well as if the bearings uh, affected there. Uh, this cap I'm suspecting here is 4.7 microfarad, so I'm going to swap that out. See if that makes a difference. So I've got a replacement 4.7 microfarad cap. Let's just get a little bit of flux around there. The difficulty here is on this side. It's right next to that resonator there. Uh, I'm just going to try and uh, use this braid here. Sometimes I'll twist this braid because it's it, it spreads. If you use thin braid that's the right size you won't have this problem but this is like really thick stuff. You can see there's a strand hanging on the end there as well. Let's just try and squeeze into that point. Trying to push into the cap here and then just lift it a little bit. Yeah, it is coming up. It is coming up here. This is not the best way of doing it. Two irons is one way, hot air is another, that side's off. This is the sort of thing that would be swapped out on a drive like this once in its lifetime, probably. You know, if it survives long enough to have bad heads after this. Or a motor failure or something. There we go. So pads are fine. Right, so we've got the old cap here. Uh, as suspected, it's balked. Hang on. 10 ohms. <laughs> I've done this a few times there. Can you see that? 10 ohms. So yeah, it's turned into a resistor. And when you've got it on a timing circuit, which is I believe where that sits, 10 ohms is, you know, you've got an RC <laughs> delay, haven't you? You know, uh, yeah, it makes a huge difference. So the band is down the bottom here, positives on this side. Uh, let's just uh, try and kill that, oh, kill that solder inwards. That's all right. I thought I'd moved it and I haven't. And let's just try and flow a blob of solder on there. Yeah, I can remove the excess in a minute. It's a bit beady, that. That's pretty big. We just want it to be uh, held in position while we solder it. Of course, this side here is really difficult because of the resonator again. I mean, you could try and lift that, I guess. But if I just uh, squeeze right in there and just flow some solder. Got some on the can here. I'll need to remove that. Just remove the excess from the iron and uh, remove it from there, there, all that. Let's just straighten the edge of that resonator, there we go, it just looks a bit better. So we just need to get a cotton bud in there now and uh, clean around that. Uh, we do have a bit of solder there, just remove off that cam. There we go, there we go, it fell out. And there we go, finally a success within this video, 11 out of 11 on both the upper and the lower heads. So yeah, I have cleaned the heads, but I'll get a little bit of grease in there, uh, just clean up that uh, bit of flux around the capacitors there, and reassemble it, that one's done. And you can see there, look at the speed. Hopefully you can tell by eye, that's about half as fast as it was rotating. If that cap is bad, you get it going crazy. This happens a lot on Sony drives and STs and STEs as well. I've fixed so many Atari STE drives that way. It's a bit different with the STFM because a lot of those are the Epson drives. And you know what? When those fail, it's usually one of the ICs, I think. All the heads, perhaps. I'm just going to squash cotton bud here. It's got IPA on it, this. But if you squash it super thin, then you will be able to just squeeze it in there like that. So that you can get onto the pad. Clean the edge of that as well. Yeah, I got away quite lightly with that there. Often you will melt that if you're not careful. You know what? Because it's got uh, a crystal in there, you know, it's a resonator. You could uh, damage it. So, yeah, you do have to be uh, careful. It's, it is quite hard because of the clearance. You know, you've got so little clearance around there. 
the clue that it leaked is the solder was like really dark and uh, when I came to you know suck it up with the uh, braid there it didn't uh, you know suck up very well at all so I did of course just touch this a little bit on the edge as well here this just a little bit of rough plastic there let's just strain that off yeah that's all right so I got away lightly these are the things you've got to be careful of you know touching and melting you could as I say perhaps lift this up it looks that way doesn't it, it looks like you could I don't want to do it it might be glued down but you could lift it looks like it's glued actually I can see some mastic or something under there but you could in theory lift that up or you could get a piece of captain tape down there that's perhaps the best thing to do but you can see I barely touched just the very edge of that there so that's okay so it just needs a bit of grease in here and uh, that one's done it just needs a you know a thorough testing and that can wing its way back to Tom and using that same test there we can get it going up and down the disc if I just hit F2 that's gone to cylinder zero. So just get it moving around the disc. Uh, and of course the net result of that is you can move the heads up this side here and then just clean off any excesses we've got there. There's just a bit too much there and again down here perhaps just a little bit too much. Yeah that's not too bad. And obviously the key is 1111 1111 11 11 so you know each of the three positions you know let's start of the disc sector zero middle uppermost track always 11 11 and that's what you need so that drives fine so the final one on this video this is good here but clearly it isn't um yeah always connect pin one upright you can tell because you can see that hole there there's a little hole in the pcb which corresponds with the notch there and obviously the cable is connected up to the Amiga correctly there with respect to pin 1, the red stripe. And uh, connect the power up again to make sure you get that the right way around. And we'll test this one. I think this may have the same sort of problem actually. Because it sounds like it's spinning really fast. But the head alignment is not right. Now those pluses, that's the first thing I've just spotted there. Which makes me think it's a an alignment problem. Actually. That's interesting. Let's just eject it, put it back in. Yeah, you see we're getting different values there. Look at those X's. That looks like it's trying to read, but it can't quite. So, uh, yeah, we'll take this one to pieces. Just clean the heads, I think, first of all. So these Epson ones, you undo the screws from the underneath, and then you can pull this out. Now, previously I've shown you can cut this tape here, but you don't need to. You can just, oh, look at that. It's just Falling straight out there. I hope it didn't damage the ribbon. There we go, let's take that out. Um, what's this here? We've got some copper there, look. Ah, oh, it's just a grounding point. Yeah, that's just a grounding point there to uh, that. So, yeah, this part here can easily just fall off if you're not careful. But you've got to watch out, you don't damage the ribbon there. Just looking for caps and things, don't see any electrolytics on there. This is exactly the same kind of drive you see in some STs, actually. So I've got a cotton bud with some IPA on it. These are those ones where you can't lift it very far. It's got this thing here, this lever. So, yeah, it can make them quite hard, actually, these Epsom ones. But the bottom head, yeah, not too hard to clean. Try and rotate the cotton bud a little bit as well. Well, that did make a difference, as you can see. The uh, lower head is kind of doing something bottom head yeah there's just a little you know you can see some activity there but it's uh it's out isn't it if it is an alignment thing this is what we saw and those are the two drives and i'm inclined to think it's probably the heads on this actually so i've got a mouse problem with this board oh, i'll be a separate video i just can't work it out at the moment it's going to be a trace because obviously this a500 plus was repaired i don't know two or three years ago now uh, it's been totally reliable, you know, I've used this board an awful lot, but at some point, I've obviously damaged one of the connections I've fixed previously, and the left mouse button just intermittently starts playing up. But anyway, that'll be another repair. The thing I've just learned about this Epsom drive is mechanically, well, I'll show you, so let me just show you the screen. So you can see there, zero, zero on both, yeah, and if I just uh, hold the drive up and press the base upwards, see that, 11, 11. Now, I've just spent ages aligning this, but I've got to, hang on, try and hold it. I've got to hold it like that, and I'll show you how I'm holding it in a minute. If I now press the cheek, so we're at the beginning of the disc, 11, 11, 11, 11. Middle of the disc, 11, 11, 11, 11. End of the disc, 11, 11, 11, 11. 
Need enough leavens for you. <laughs> anyway, it's reliable. But I am having to do that. I'm pulling this motor part upwards. And obviously that's going to affect uh, the, well, everything, the alignment of everything. This is the problem. Uh, and it made me think, actually, I think the issue with that other drive is a mechanical alignment problem. You know, there's two we looked at at the beginning. It's not just about head alignment. It's about the whole chassis. You just get a slight bend in the chassis somewhere and uh, it stops reading, but that's fine. If I take my thumb off there, it stops the bottom of my head. Uh, the upper head shows 7-11. I just press it back down again and 11 11 i can show you that so just letting it sit there you can see there's nothing and if i just uh, press the chassis together in both halves hang on a sec and the pressing the chassis together you can see 11 11 11 11 let go goes again press it together it's back again so that's really annoying so spending ages with this uh, this is the problem here this is bent can you see this just look at that from that angle it's had a knock, the button's had a knock. This needs bending out like, oh, I can't even do it. I need to get some pliers onto it. We need to straighten it. You, you can perhaps better see it here. It's kind of like deformed a bit. It's had a knock. Finally got it working. That one was uh, SOB to get working, seriously. What I was finding is on Across the disc, the alignment was good up until sector 79, and then you had like 10 11, or most of the time 11 11, but it would occasionally just flip to 10 of 11. So, of course, I adjusted the heads, that was it. I spent 20 minutes trying to find a position again, it was like 0 out of 11 for goodness knows how long. Um, but prior to that, the other thing that gave me some stability there was tightening the two screws on the side of the drives there, they were a bit loose, tighten them up super tight, and then it became super reliable. So that was the issue with the mechanism, as well as that bend, I straightened that bend out on that button. So those two things combined were the issue. I think maybe the heads got knocked out of alignment at some point. That sometimes happens when the disc gets stuck in there, or the, you know, the metal shield comes off and it catches on the head. So yeah, that's the sort of thing that can happen. But if I now seek the disc here, you see we're on 79, go to 0, 11, 11, middle of the disc, 11, 11, end of the disc. 11, 11 and again if I eject the disc this is the thing certainly with this model you've got to do this test if you can't you know eject it like that and get uh, you know reliability every single time you know it's not going to be robust enough but that's fine I'll seat back to zero sweet so again like the other one I'll uh, lubricate this one up clean the, the switches I did that on the other one as well got some deoxit in there and uh, test it for a period of time but at least we've ended on the positive here two drives that I couldn't fix, two drives that I could fix. So I haven't given up on those other two drives, I'll revisit. I haven't learned what we've learned of this one, that the mechanical side of the drive can be the problem where you get misalignment as you go further up the disc. But uh, I mean, anyway, one of the heads was broken, wasn't it, on, one, on that first drive. So this is a month or so after I sent the drives back to Tom Meads and uh, one of the drives he got back, I think he said it wasn't working, it's the Epsom, and that one, as I did say, was susceptible to any kind of knock at all, certainly on the button, uh, the piece of metal that holds the button, alters the alignment of the chassis, so I think that's what's happened, I've told him to either send that back with something else who wants to be looking at in the future, or I'll buy it off him, because I know I can get that drive working, I know there's nothing really wrong with it, other than, perhaps when he's put the button back on, he may have straightened the metal, that's enough to put it back out of alignment again. It really is that simple on the Epson ones. But anyway, so this drive, one of the ones we were looking at earlier, it's uh, a bit better after having revisited it. Now the problem here is in the middle of the disc. You can see here the uh, upper head showing 9 out of 11. But if we go to the end of the disc, that looks good. Start of the disc, that looks good. So it's just the middle of the disc. And I'll just leave you watching that. If I just touch the head, on the left hand side, I'll show you where in a sec. See that, 11, 11. Hang on, yeah, if I put pressure on it, 11, 11. And all I was doing there is just literally touching that, like that, very gently. Hardly any pressure at all. So I think what's happened on this, you know, it's a common thing with these. If I uh, switch this off and show you the head, and let me just take the disc out. The head kind of sags this way, yeah? just by virtue of when this metal thing pulls it up. Can you see, let me just eject it. 
if you just if you just watch this metal here it pushes this upwards just watch can you see like the head's sunk down now but when there's obviously no disc in see it's lifted up here bends this metal that way that is the issue with these drives so I mean what can you do about that well you can close that like that you could pick the head up and you could bend it like that that might be better I don't know could be out of alignment now of course anyway let's just eject it again put the disc in and we'll try again and surprisingly after that little bend you can see it's working I'll go to the start of the disc 11-11 middle of the disc this is where it was balked 11-11 look end of the disc 11-11 so it's anybody's guess as to how long term that fix would be because obviously we've had to bend it so with I don't know a few dozen or a few hundred insertions and removals maybe it'll just sag on that side again and um, that is the problem so I'll test this for a prolonged period of time I'll probably end up just keeping this drive as a test drive you know when I'm working on boards and stuff anyway let's try uh, June on it now see if it'll boot with June so yeah it's going to take a lot more testing but you can see it's gone, I think that's gone round one time, hasn't it? I think that's the almost the end of that demo. There's a bit of the hard cone in here, look. So I'll just let that loop round a few times, then I'll do some more tests on it. I'll report back. So this is months later, if I just uh, power this on. Uh, I've been using this drive on pretty much all the recent videos I've been doing, some of which have not been uploaded yet, but it's been used as the main workhorse for all MEGA testing here. You can see it booted there, let me show you, hang on. Yeah, you'll see, look, there's a 10 out of 11, that's the nearest to get it, but it is reliable. If I seek to a different cylinder, look, 11, 11, end of the disc, 11, 11. So this was the final outcome. This is how accurate I could get it dialed in. There was still just this tiny fluctuation here, but I am not disturbing that because I know that generally when it's the right way up, and it's, I'll be honest, it's freezing in here at the moment, when it's warm in here and it's the right way up, I'll get 11 out of 11 consistently across the disc without an issue. But So I can live with that. And yeah, it's just had so much use. There is no problem with that I don't think and you can tell perhaps it's the original one because remember there was a like a bend here wasn't there and it was the first drive I ended up transplanting the heads from the, the replacement model it was the same as this one into the first drive and it made sense to do that because we'd done all the stuff hadn't we we'd recapped it and stuff I think I might have done this board I, can't, I don't think there was a cap on that board uh, no there wasn't uh, but I'd lubricated it we lubricated all the stuff all the metal parts clean the heads etc these were demagnetized at various points when I was having major problems but it was that bottom head and the top head both heads on the other drive you saw the top head they got those little bits of silicon yeah those are detached couldn't join those back up I would suggest you do use silicon to join those things back on yeah remove the old stuff and use a little bit of silicon but the bottom head just got sheared off now I didn't have any footage around that I just showed you was, you know we just cut to oh my god look the head's fallen off and it literally did fall off what I did is I tried to clean the top head no problems touched the bottom of the cotton bud and it just fell straight off and I think the silicon had gone on the bottom head as well just like the top one so of course as you rub with the cotton bud it just falls off the clue that the top head was loose there that way um, if you rewind and watch that bit of the video I was cleaning the, the, the top head with the cotton bud instead of the head just moving you know so let's say I don't know let's say that's the top of the head let's say you can just see that part there and that's the head instead of it just moving a little bit like that side to side the head was going like that that top head was going like that because the, the the silicon bits were not holding onto the metal it was already loose um, so yeah and that's a reason perhaps just to be careful about how much pressure you put on these heads when you're cleaning them but I am sure that it's not the cleaning technique the minute I got the cotton bud on there that top head was uh, a bit wobbly um, and the bottom head yeah it, it didn't look loose but so yeah it just sheared straight off one reason those top heads can uh, get damaged like that with the silicon there is an alignment problem if this chassis gets warped or something or this metal shutter comes off here what would happen if someone would push, push the disc in yeah if that metal shutter was bent or lifted here when you eject it the metal shutter can catch on the head the same thing could happen if the, you pressed this down you could do that yourself if you press that down as you ejected the head would get caught in the shutter here and it would rip the top head off so yeah I'm not exactly sure what happened to that drive previously but what I do know is you saw it was in terrible state and uh, somebody had tried to repair it um, I can't remember who sent to me I'm pretty sure it was uh, somebody I know perhaps Tom Meads or could have been Stefan um, 
whoever it was thank you very much you may recognize it from the state it was in um but uh, yeah it's amazing we managed to get it working it really is it's uh, i'd given up i'd totally given up on it and of course the other drive now is just for spares because uh, you know we're a bottom head down and the top head has got that problem with the the the, the glue bits you know broken off but i've kept it because i might be able to use that top head with a bit of silicon and fix another one of these one where perhaps the top head's been sheared off so the other thing worth pointing out which relates to both the Epsom drive and this and any floppy drive really is the mechanical thing you know so like if you were to you know if the, the chassis got bent on one side or the other or this mechanism got twisted or this bit here this metal here was lifted up at this point and lower at this point or pressed in the middle and then someone straight down raised this bit but there's then a dip in the middle those are all sorts of mechanical issues that mean that when you know you're at this point here you know this is the right height therefore the pressure and tension around here is perfect you get 1111 and then you scan to the middle of the disc well there's a bit of a sag here someone never strained it out properly and that was part of the issue with this I did that you know you saw me bend the head and straighten it that didn't do it entirely to get total reliability what I ended up doing is I took this out completely and I realized it was dipping a bit I think somewhere along here I can't wear now and I just strained it it was very little in it but I strained it totally and that's how we've ended up with uh, as, you know, the alignment we've got now which is pretty much perfect um, so yeah you've got to bear that sort of thing in mind similarly if you have not got grease on here that's going to wear and if that wears it's going to be marginally you know nearer to this side isn't it the head's going to you know it puts like just ever so slight twist anyway so hopefully you found the video interesting we have covered some new ground you know the switch and stuff and then the bit about the alignment um yeah thanks for watching i'll catch you in the next video